Every single day, week, year, everyone wondering how she does it with no fear all the time. Hello, everybody. Hello, Facebook Village, Affinity Village, Chi Town Universe. Um, welcome. Good evening, good people. Uh, that intro that you heard was actually Tadao, which is <laughs> my first time hearing this song. I really like it. I hope you liked it too. But good even again, good evening, good people. I'm Kelly Suzanne Salisbury, and welcome to Living Room Chats at Affinity, a podcast for brave conversations and bold voices. Living Room Chats is my monthly podcast that will take place the third Wednesday of each month at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time and will be live streamed on Affinity's Facebook page. I'll dive into topics like political advocacy, culture, identity, and spirituality with people from different backgrounds, walks of life, and perspectives. We'll have conversations that move beyond the superficial and safe to an authentic place where we can be ourselves dare to question things, and candidly express what we think and how we feel. I'm delighted to be joined tonight by a live audience in Affinity's beautiful and cozy living room in Bronzeville and Chicago South Side. Want to make some noise, y'all? <laughs> so thank you all for being here, and thanks to those of you tuning in to Living Room Chats via the live stream. You can join the conversation on social media at Affinity's Facebook and Twitter pages using the hashtags LRC Affinity Podcast, LRC Kelly Podcast, and of course, hashtag We Are Affinity. While I'm happy to be part of the Affinity family, the views I express here are my own or the views of the individual guest. These views do not necessarily express the views or opinions of Affinity Community Services. I'm honored to have Jackie Boyd as my conversation buddy tonight. She is a fierce advocate, fly fashionista, phenomenal friend, and founder of the Care Plan, which we'll learn more about later. While Jackie and I have known each other for several years, it's been only in the past two years that we've gotten to know each other more deeply and develop a beautiful friendship. Our living room chat tonight will focus on family, friendship, and community, and their impact on Jackie's advocacy, career path, and life choices. Before we start, let me share her bio with you. Jacqueline Boyd brings passion and expertise to the field of aging and LGBTQ plus advocacy. A dynamic speaker, facilitator, and entrepreneur, Jacqueline is the owner of The Care Plan. The Care Plan is the country's first LGBTQ plus centered care management company. The Care Plan's innovative model of client directed care provides advocacy, care navigation, and advanced planning for successful aging experiences. Jacqueline is, is a sought after speaker and author, having presented at the American Society on Aging National Conference, Creating Change Conference, the Los Angeles County Older Adult Summit, and University of Chicago among others. She was recently contributed a chapter to Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Health and Aging, available from Springer Publishing, and authored the guide to Create Your Care Plan, an LGBT person's guide to preparing for medical procedures. Let's give a warm and hearty welcome to Jackie Boyd. Thank you so much, Kelly. It is wonderful to be here with you tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm thrilled, thrilled to have you here at Living Room Chats at Affinity. And um, so you and I, as I mentioned, we go back several years. We've known each other for several years, but it's been very recently with, within the past two years that we've really gotten a chance to know each other more intimately and spend more time together um, and to actually develop a friendship that has grown uh, very meaningful to me. And, you know, when deciding sort of like what I wanted to talk about for this podcast, you know, one of the things that, one of the things I thought about was, you know what, family, friendship, and community. Because as I get older, I'm 40 years old, and um, the older I get, uh, the more appreciative I am of family, friendship, and community. 
And in a time right now where we're seeing so many people behaving badly, people being nasty toward each other, being divisive, and those kinds of things, I think that now is a time more than ever that we really need to embrace what family is, however we define it, what friendship is, and what community is. Um, and so I know that those are things, those are values and practices uh, that you embody. And so I thought that it would be wonderful to have this conversation about family, friendship, and community with you um, and to sort of get your feel of what those things mean to you and how they shape how you live your life and your life choices. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so tonight's chat is about that. So let, let's start with the early part of your life. So I know that you are from, you've been living in Chicago for several years, but you're from a rural town in Illinois. So can you speak to us about, you know, your upbringing, your family growing up there, what it was like, um, and, you know, how, how your family and upbringing there shaped you, and then what brought you to Chicago? Sure, we'll start with a small question. Um, <laughs> well, so I grew up in a town of less than 2,000 people um, in sort of the cornfields of Illinois. Uh, and I think that's the case for a lot of folks that transplant to Chicago. It's kind of the biggest city around. And mm -hmm. so you get folks that don't feel like they fit in in their hometowns coming here a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those people. So. Um, where I grew up, it was so small. My family was the only family of color in town. Uh, and, you know, I was thinking about my queer identity through high school, but didn't really uh, live into it or, or explore it because there was, again, there was like one other gay person in town. <laughs> and so you found, I found family of choice really early on uh, because you just need support. And I think one of the blessings of feeling different or being different is that you find other folks that are that are different in their own way to create family with and that's really what happened when i was in high school you know um sort of having felt pretty lonely throughout my growing up years in high school i found just kind of a random group of folks that were theater kids or you know smoked a lot of weed or you know did did dance like we were just a group of kind of misfits that came together and and got along and laughed a lot and acted silly and so that was kind of my first understanding of family of choice is mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be folks that are like you mm -hmm. but the power of a shared experience and for us it was kind of that experience of feeling different of needing support and of knowing that the world was bigger than our town mm -hmm. so that was what really sort of molded us and i still have that friend circle like those are still wow. the people that know stuff that nobody else knows or needs to know <laughs> about me <laughs> but you know we still we get together and you know i see them when i go back home and it's it's amazing to have family of choice that was established that early mm -hmm. um that really didn't have much to do with my queer identity mm -hmm. right i at that point that wasn't what i was leading with it was mm -hmm. other other things that were part of what was shaping me at that time yeah. so yeah and what about your um so you talked about your family of choice but what about your um how, how would you say it um your family immediate origin yeah, your, your family of <laughs> origin can you can you tell us a little bit about that and how that shaped your notion of family and community and, and sort of where you fit into the world yeah i was very very blessed mm -hmm. because my parents had got married when they were like 22 years old they both um, traveled the country, came back to this small town. My dad's black, my mom's white. And I can only imagine how difficult that was for him mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. But my dad is just the kindest, most funny, most charming man you could ever hope to meet. And so he made it work, you know. And, and they both had a deep relationship with their own spirituality, with the mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. And so we were a family that gave back and they just consistently were giving back. Um, always, every Sunday we were in church and throughout the week we were doing different things. And, you know, my mom is somebody who is a, is a builder, kind of in the same way I'm a builder. Like mm -hmm. she just saw things that needed to be fixed and found a solution and brought a lot of folks along for the ride. So I was really, really lucky to have great examples of what giving back looks like, what building community looks like, there was actually a moment in school where I was um, really concerned for a, a younger friend of mine because she had confided in me that she didn't have, uh, that their family wasn't going to have Christmas. Like mm. the father had left, they were kind of just 
it was three kids and a mom who was struggling and so she was really upset and just sort of broke down crying and this was when I was like nine years old so I was pretty young and I went home and I told my parents and I find out three weeks later after Christmas that my dad and mom had bought a bunch of presents for her family so that they could have Christmas and that was like when people do good things mm-hmm. without needing awards or needing yes. praise for it yes. is that's the example that that I think we should all hope to mm-hmm. follow mm-hmm. and sort of instill in each other and the ways that we treat each other mm-hmm. um, and so that you know I just had a really good foundation my parents also had always wanted a big family and so uh, three of my younger brothers and sisters are adopted mm-hmm. and so that also kind of expanded mm-hmm. my notion of family early on it was never a question like whoever's around you whoever loves you whoever you love they're your people and mm-hmm. that's and you take care of each other that's a beautiful thing and and I can tell that that was instilled in you and that's something that you carry on because one of the things that uh, I really love about Jackie is just how sincere she is, um, how committed to uh, friends she is. There are some people who have a million and one friends and they talk about friendship, but they don't really uh, necessarily embody that or maybe know how to embody that in their actions. And I really admire and respect um, how incredibly gracious you are and how attentive and present you are um, with friends. And you're someone who you give a lot, you do a lot, and yet uh, whenever I'm talking to you, whether it's um, on the phone, in person, in email, you are completely present. I always feel like I'm the only person in the world um, at that moment. Um, And so I just wanna say it's very special. It's not something that I experience a lot of, but um, it it really speaks to your character and kudos to your family uh, for really instilling that in you. They have a a lot to be proud of. Oh, Kelly, thank you so much. And it's really hard to just take that, but thank you. (laughs) I'm like trying not to squirm. (laughs) So, what brought you to Chicago? Well, I was from a very small town where <laughs> so, I was different. But what is this? You keep saying small town. What is the small town? Where is it in Illinois? And oh, all yeah. of that. Well, Tell us about that and then what brought you to Chi-Town. It's in, a be- it's in like the most beautiful part of the state, I think. It's mm-hmm. in the northwestern corner. It's a town called Mount Carroll. It's really cute and historical and there's brick streets and wonderful people and if any of them are watching, hi. Um, <laughs> But it was just, it was, I wanted to experience more. Mm-hmm. And so I went to school at Loyola mm. um, and and just came to Chicago because it was close enough to family. So I'm the oldest, so all of my siblings were still at home. Mm. And I felt like I want to be nearby to be sure that I'm, that they have the experience of knowing me as their sister, right. not like that I'm just some far-flung memory. Sure. Um, and that's that's proven to be a really good decision. And what did you do at Loyola? Studied psychology, mm-hmm. studied women's studies, like Woo-hoo. a good queer. Yes, <laughs> that was my minor. That was my minor at Wellesley. Not that I'm a walking stereotype or anything. But yeah. We're sitting stereotypes right, right now. So it's okay. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. But uh, yeah, so so I went to school for that, and while I was in school. I was kind of annoyed by the way that I'm not an academic and Mm -hmm. and no shame to anybody that is, but it just wasn't the right fit for me to like to live in wholeheartedly. So when I was at Loyola, I was really questioning like, okay, I'm studying psychology. I'm studying a lot of theory, but if I want to actually help somebody, if somebody falls in front of me, if somebody has a heart attack, if somebody's, you know, in danger and pain, or if, if my family members need help, how, what does that look like physically? How do you actually take care of somebody? Mm-hmm. And so that was what what made, what made piqued my interest in becoming a certified nursing assistant. Mm. I wanted to, to do something where I could balance out sort of the, this is how we're gonna think about your mental health with mm-hmm. what does it actually take to take care of someone physically? Mm. And so that was, it was just, I needed that balance and so that's what I did there. <laughs> so in your in your journey within that line of work, how do your values related to family, friendship and community, how are those reflected in terms of the work that you chose to do and that led up to your creating the care plan and being very active and involved in LGBTQ communities in Chicago? Yeah, well, I think you know, there is a real magic in taking care of another person. And I, and I don't mean like just dropping off, you know, a meal or flowers, like that's, that's good to do, but 
if when you are actually in an intimate space with somebody and you are taking care of their body, you are assisting them with bathing, with things that are uncomfortable to have mm -hmm. somebody there for, like mm -hmm. toileting, you have to figure out how to bridge that gap of, of, of sort of shyness and, and fear mm -hmm. and, and it just, it gives you a different perspective and it creates a different kind of relationship. So, mm -hmm. you know, with my clients at that time, when I was in the nursing home, you know, they maybe didn't see many of their family members. There maybe their family members had passed on. I had a client who was 104 years old and she was feisty as all get out. She would holler, sun up to sundown, and then continue on. <laughs> and the only thing that calmed her down was it, when I would uh, read the Bible to her or sing mm. to her. And we would be at like three in the morning on the night shift, like sitting there singing to this woman that's 104 years mm. old. And those are moments of familial connection, even if there's no blood relation. That's right. Even if she doesn't know me and won't remember me tomorrow, mm -hmm. that feels you create environments that are safe. Mm -hmm. And so I think that magic of how you bridge, how you bridge the, the gaps uh, or, or norms in society mm -hmm. through care are mm -hmm. really intriguing to me. And, and, and points I, of opportunity for real human visceral connection. Yeah. Exactly. That go beyond the surface, which is, it sounds like what you were getting at. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so from that lens, I, I, um, got into working for DCFS for a few years and just really struggled with that system. I was like, I don't feel like I'm actually helping people. And what was um, your struggle and what do you think the barriers were uh, for you? Uh, numerous, but for me, it was, I felt like I was recreating trauma for young people. So in the way that if a young person has been taken away from their parents, like I know what that feels like and what that does to somebody as an outsider from seeing what it's done, how it affected my siblings who were mm -hmm. adopted, mm -hmm. to have that not knowing, to have that having been part of a system. And then to, when you think about um, just how, I'm sorry, I'm like sort of, Sorry, I'm like in my in a family moment. No, please, please, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so when I was working for DCFS, I was just really frustrated by the fact that every single week I had to do these visits where I was taking kids away from their parents again. And that and then the parents would be doing everything they could and maybe their court dates would be extended because a judge didn't show up or there wasn't a court reporter or something that was totally beyond their control. And it just felt wrong. Mm -hmm. I was like, I can't continue to try and give folks hope that their mm -hmm. family's going to get back together or that they're going to be with their parents again when every single week I'm picking you up and taking you away from your mom. Mm -hmm. Like that just, for people that are trying to help, I think it, it makes it really, really hard when the systems are are um, are built in a way that's, you know, less, less than perfect. In some ways that fracture families mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of trying to build them yeah. or foster a deeper sense of connection. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that, in particular, definitely informs my work, mm -hmm. you know, and why I started a business versus a nonprofit mm -hmm. um, or versus working for somebody else. Because at a certain point, you have to compromise your ethics, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not your own boss, you have to compromise your ethics mm -hmm. or the way that you think the work should get done or doing the right thing in the moment. And I just... I really feel like people are worth going the extra mile for. Mm -hmm. People are worth thinking outside the box for. Mm -hmm. And especially as queer people, we are worth the long game. Yeah. We are worth figuring out for the long haul so that we can live with dignity and respect and grace through the end of our lives. Mm. So this is a great segue because you touched on some of the things that led you, like your previous um, experiences and working within systems and wanting to make a positive impact um, on human, um, on the lives of human beings and to foster connection and to offer humane support, but you kept hitting this brick wall in a system that just didn't reflect your values in terms of not only what it was doing, but how. So you touched a bit on that. So can you, can you share with us a little bit more about what led you to creating the care plan? And then also you mentioned you created this as a business, not a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So why that and how does having a business that is not a non that doesn't have nonprofit status how does that help you live out um, and actualize your values around family and friendship and community uh, with your ethical compass sure yeah yeah i'll start there um so 
for me, having worked in nonprofits, having worked in a small business for other for a, a, another person, I just that that ethical piece of like doing the right thing every time is is what I wanted to have happen in my own business. And so when I started the company, I, I there was no question because I wanted to have choice and I didn't want to have to beg for money and resources. And that's oftentimes in nonprofit world, mm -hmm. you spend half of the yeah. time and half of people's <laughs> energy and brilliance on chasing a dollar mm -hmm. when, and then you still have to say no, you mm -hmm. still have to say no. Mm -hmm. And I believe in equity and I believe in paying people what they're worth and I believe in making the right choice. And so I, I sort of have a hybrid model, right? So. We are, our rates are what they are, but then we slide down to free for people that need it. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I get to have that, that equity and making the right choices for people and equal access to mm -hmm. services that we provide mm -hmm. um, without having to compromise and, and spend energy in a direction that's other than what our purpose really is. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's important. Because then that allows you really to be able to live out your values to your business and you don't feel that there is a tension that is irreconcilable. And um, as someone who worked in nonprofit for several years, I do have to share that that was one of uh, my biggest pet peeves is that um, it's just hearing so many executive directors of organizations that have really compelling missions, you know, talk about the fact that they um, have to spend so much time raising money. Um, and that they would rather spend their time and energy doing other things that really help fulfill the mission. Um, and so it's a, it's a really, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very sticky situation to be in. So it's great that you were able to find a model that really worked for you, that uh, allowed you to live out your values through your business. Well, and the other piece that I think has been a revelation to me over time is what doing something like this does for your health, for your physical health. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize how hard the system of working nine to five, eight to five, for me it was like seven to seven, six days a week mm -hmm. for another organization with sort of rules around time off, right? Mm -hmm. So like you, your time is not your own. And that is something other than autonomy. Mm -hmm. That's that's a system that does not reinforce our dignity, that does not reinforce our freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. And so when I got out of that and started my own business, even when I had no money, no money in my pocket, was hustling. I mean, I like taught kids after school chess and I barely play chess and <laughs> I did Uber and everything else. Like it was a hustle. I had folks in my house for Airbnb. Like I was wow. doing all the hustles the first year of the business. Mm -hmm. But the stress I felt, no yeah. day was stressful. In the midst of all of that, doing all mm -hmm. kinds of things to stay afloat financially mm -hmm. and to be able to have your business, you still felt a lot less stressed. I've had three days of stress that equaled every day of stress that I had at my old jobs. Wow. And it doesn't matter what job it was. Being there at a certain time, putting everything you have into other people and not getting fed back, mm -hmm. not having the freedom to take time off or to go have lunch with your family mm -hmm. if they're in town mm -hmm. or to say, you know what? Like for example, the day after the Pulse Orlando shooting, yep. I took off. I was like, there is nothing more important than than acknowledging what has happened mm -hmm. and taking some time and space. Right. Like today is not the day that I take care of other people. Today's the day I take care of myself. Mm -hmm. Not having to ask permission for that right. just mm -hmm. felt so good. It felt like mm -hmm. you could actually take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's really critical. And so many workers, um, employees in the United States just do not have that um, whatsoever. They feel they, I mean, if you're fortunate enough to even have a, a job that offers you sick days or vacation days, sometimes you feel guilty even taking them, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real dilemma, it's a real problem. And it does not, um, it's not conducive to healthy environments, healthy workspaces, full beings and those kinds of things. So considering, in addition to that, considering a lot of the, the work that you do, which I know is a vocation for you, it's a mission for you, the work that you do with the care plan, as well as your volunteer advocacy work. Um, at the same time, I'm sure that you um, are, in your work with the care plan, you're working with people who are facing very sobering issues. In addition to living life on their terms, I'm, um, I know that you also help people plan their exit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And dealing with illness. Um, and helping prepare their family's plan 
you know, for what's next and, you know, who can help love and take care of them and those kinds of things. And I imagine that that's not always easy. So how do family, friendship and community help support and sustain you mm-hmm. in the work that you do? Well, family, I mean, those three are just they I feel like they're cornerstones in my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I have I have many family members and many family of choice groups. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that like for me, my mental health comes first because I can't take care of anybody else if I'm not in a good place. But spending time with folks that get it, with folks that are either in a similar boat as you, feel feel close to you, show up for you, like that's the critical piece for me that I had to realize as an adult was it's not just about me showing up for other folks, it's about how they show up for me. Mm. Like, I'm not going to need you all the time, but when I need you, I need you to be there and solid. Right. I have a friend who is, she's so funny, she is a uh, very hands-off. I'm a very touchy-feely person, mm-hmm. and she's like, never touch me, please. <laughs> and she sort of, um, she, she acknowledges, she's like, I'm emotionally stunted. I'm not going to cry in front of you. I'm not going to cry for you. Like, right. but if you need me, I'm here. And mm-hmm. and that's the case. She's like, you can, you know, lean on my shoulder, but I'm not going to hug you. Right. You know, like, I but she's know there like for that. me. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, that's mm-hmm. a family. That's family. She's family to me. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter if we love in the same way. It matters that we love each other and that we show up for each other. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I would say it's critical, you know, especially here in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Like I, um, I've, some of the folks here know that I, I assist with me and that's not uncommon you know, for our communities, like a lot yep. of folks raise family members, mm-hmm. raise younger siblings or nieces, nephews, grandchildren. Um, but I could not have done that without family of choice. Mm-hmm. Cause I didn't have family of origin in the city with me. So it was my best friends that I mm-hmm. said, as soon as she came and she came, you know, it was not planned. Like one day she was in my parents' house, the next day she was in mine. And I emailed my friends and I said, I need you. And I need you to get through this. And I'm not going to be as present or available in our friendship for a while. I don't know how long, but I want you to know that I love you and I care about you. And the way that I'm going to try to, you know, build relationships for her and build family for her and maintain my connections to you are let's have a family dinner every Sunday. Anybody that's available, come over, show up, I'll cook. And, and that was such a saving grace for me and for her. You know, she still talks about that. Wow. Two of the people that are my family of choice that were at those dinners every Sunday have become her closest friends. They were mm-hmm. with her and I in the room when she had a baby. So wow. it's just, that's what I mean, like family, unconditional love. If you really love somebody mm-hmm. and they're your family, they're your family. Mm-hmm. It's not about blood, it's about, it's about the connection. It is, and it's funny that you say that because I, um, when we were, when we had our phone touch base yesterday, um, we talked very briefly about, like, I don't know about any of y'all here and those of you who are watching via the live stream, there are certain notions of family that, um, like certain expressions that some of us are used to hearing. So blood is thicker than water, right? Like that's something that I grew up hearing a lot of. And as much as um, many members of my biological family mean to me, I have to say that, you know, my chosen family, like members of my chosen family have really shown up for me in ways that some folks in my biological family didn't. And I really experienced this the first time when I was disowned uh, by a couple of folks in my family. Thank goodness, not my parents, okay? My parents never disowned me. Um, but I had um, an aunt I grew up being incredibly close to. Um, aunts were very important in my family. Um, and one aunt in particular just wanted nothing to do with me when she realized I was gay. Um, and that was in 2001. She cut off all contact with me, um, has not wanted to have any contact since, um, and made it very clear that I was not to call her, not to connect with her in any way. And so the very rare times that we see each other are at family funerals. Mm-hmm. And um, at first, that was incredibly painful to deal with someone who was such an integral part of my life, someone who was always around, you know, someone who, at least at the time, I thought loved me, supported me, you know, took me places. We went to, uh, we had 
apply to colleges and all of these different things, and then all of a sudden it's like, boom, done, you no longer exist. So it's very painful um, to experience that. And it, you know, I, I was in therapy and, and you know, coming to grips with the fact that I, you know, I'm gay and, and, and also um, having to really develop the courage to make choices about my life, not just being a lesbian, but things I wanted to do for a living, not wanting to go to graduate school right away and those kinds of things that really um, angered some people in my family, but making a decision how I wanted to live my life. And, you know, as I sort of moved forward with that, I realized that in some ways, distance from this particular aunt was a blessing in disguise because I was actually able to live more freely and openly. I became less needy and dependent on her approval and in the meantime I was really able to create some wonderful relationships with people who respected me for who I am, what I am, and who wanted the best for me in my life. And their care for me was not conditional on what I looked like, what I studied and majored in, uh, the image I projected of the family, my sexual orientation or anything like that. And so in some ways, I, I wouldn't have known this otherwise, but I felt like an albatross had been you know, removed. And so um, at that time, like family of choice became very important to me. Uh, I mean, critically important. Mm -hmm. Because my relationship with some of my family of origin were so strained and I felt so vulnerable. So uh, what you say about family of choice really resonates with me, and I think that this whole notion of blood is thicker than water, that might be true for some people, and that might be true sometimes, and you know, I certainly don't want to minimize the importance of family of origin, um, but I, I also don't think we should denigrate the importance of family of choice. When you choose who your family members are, that is, the fact that it's a choice, they show up for you, you show up for them, that's not just a default because of bloodline or because someone is called a sister or brother. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And so that you know that that really resonates with me on so many levels. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say that I'm so sorry that that happened, and it was wrong, and it should not have happened. I'm curious for you about if if that particular experience or other experiences sort of inform your expectations of family of choice, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. lots of folks may be around or be friends, mm -hmm. but I think there's a difference between like intimate circles, mm -hmm. intimate friendships, yep. and you know. Mm -hmm. I love that question. As a matter of fact, I think something that I learned from that is to be more precise with my language. Mm -hmm. So there are some people who say, oh, such and so is my friend and they hardly talk to the person, they hardly see the person, and they don't have any real connection. I take very seriously the difference between an acquaintance and a friend, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? And I don't confuse them. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a lot of acquaintances. I wouldn't say I have a lot of friends. And I'm okay with that because more isn't necessarily better. Um, with that being said, that I can call someone a friend and not, ha not talk to them every day or every month. That's okay too. There's a connection there, there's um, a bond, and whether we talk to each other a few times a year or every week, like there, there's some kind of connection there. And I know that I can pick up and call you, I'll be there for you and vice versa. Um, but that's for me, that's different than an acquaintance. Someone I know I have a friendly rapport with, but not that same connection. Um, so for me, it's, it's being very clear on, um, on those things. And in terms of expectations, you know, if someone, I feel like my friends that I have are people who are honest with me. They have my best interests at heart. They're going to tell me what they think and how they feel, regardless of whether or not they think I'll like it. Sometimes you need stuff that you don't like. I have a friend right now <laughs> who's right here who's an example of that. Yvonne has known me. She's right here in our audience, our live audience. I'll try not to cry. Um, um, she knew me when I was in my early 20s and um, is someone who I looked up to very early on, uh, very close to, and someone I felt like I could really talk to and be vulnerable with and confide in and not be rejected which is different than what I had was experiencing with my family, some members of my family of origin. And she's seen me grow, like go through all of the growing pains and the ups and downs and confusion and toxic relationships and not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. But 
you know, just really embracing my humanity and um, really being a sounding board and, 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 and telling me what she felt, but also not stifling me. And to me, that's an example of a friend. Um, she's a friend and like, you know, one of the best aunts I've ever had. Yes. <laughs> Can we give it up for you? <laughs> and that's rare. And so, like, that's the friendship we have. Um, and there are different types of friends that I have. They're not all the same. They don't all serve the same role and purpose. But what I do know is that there's a respect, there's a connection, there's a camaraderie. I can be myself mm -hmm. with my friends. So there's no pretense, there's no pretending or anything like that. And to me, that's what friendship is for me. Oh, yeah. Get on out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I would be friends with you, Kelly. We already <laughs> friends. <laughs> so speaking of family, something that I love about something that I that I learned when I was a baby dyke, and I came out at Wellesley again, stereotype no. Uh, I came out and then came back to, came to Chicago, where I was born and raised, and I noticed very early on that LGBTQ folks, queer folks. We say, oh, such and so, that's family. Mm -hmm. So we have a long history of calling each other family. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I sort of get what that's about. But for you, what do you think the significance of that is for you personally and for LGBTQ folks, you know, um, you know more general. broadly in general? Well, I love, I love thinking about language and like mm -hmm. what it means. And because my work spans generations, mm -hmm. like the term family, I believe was used to sort of like wink, right? Like <laughs> that person's family because I can't say that they're gay they're, or say that we're yeah. dating or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, there's still uh, clients that I work with that are in their 70s, 80s, 90s that will never call their partner mm -hmm. anything but family right. or that's my roommate or some other type mm -hmm. of relationship mm -hmm. that's close. But you know, not not naming. What is it? The love that shall not be named. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to women's studies days. Yes. Um, but uh, but I think that today, you know, family means all kinds of things. Like I know I know especially with um, when folks are sort of coming into their identities and figuring out who their friends are. You know, I've seen sort of family systems for, for people come together and then break apart or like you have a family unit and then somebody goes through a breakup and that changes the dynamic or a few people go through a breakup, right? Mm -hmm. You have like couples that start to create a family and then somebody breaks up and you're like, wait, where where the other half go? Where the rest right. of our family go and mm -hmm. what's my relationship to them now? Mm -hmm. So I think family means a lot of different things in LGBTQ mm -hmm. communities. But at the end of the day, just I think it, it comes back to these are folks that are there for you, that show Absolutely. up, that love you, that heal the hurts that have, that have harmed you. Mm -hmm. It's true. And you know, something else that I wanted to share, we touched on this a little bit before in a previous conversation, is that as important as family is, and I'm more so speaking of, um, to this point, family of origin, I think it's really important that we not fetishize family. And when I say fetishized family, I'm especially talking about family of origin, not so much family of choice, because I don't think we do that as much with family of choice, but family of origin. And I hear so much talk about, especially this um, elevation of the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. Blood is thicker than water. And family does X, Y, and Z. And, and oftentimes I find that family is talked about as some, some kind of innately benign group of folks or institution. And I think that when family are at their best, there are people who give you uh, a sense of belonging, a sense of history, heritage, culture, customs, um, lineage, um, a place where you can feel safe and loved and supported, where you can grow and develop as a human being, as a child and into an adult, um, and something that, that's always there for you. But family is also a place that it's an institution that um, is also used to justify a lot of abuse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and pain. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very, um, and to excuse behaviors that outside of the institution of family would not be excused. And so I think it's really important that we embrace what family is, what family can be when it's at the, its best, but not allow family to become insulated from critique, mm -hmm. um, insulated from um, intervention when necessary. 
Um, and I think that's very, very important because a lot of very damaging and painful things have been done in the name of family of origin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I just wanted to share that because that's something else that is that I feel very viscerally about. Well, I appreciate you taking it there, you mm -hmm. know, because a lot of times we don't we don't want to air the dirty mm -hmm. laundry that happens in our families, mm -hmm. except to our close friends. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the reality is that sometimes the people that hurt you the most mm -hmm. are your family, right. <laughs> yeah. you know. And yeah. I don't think, especially with family of origin, you can't be that entwined, mm -hmm. right? Live in the same house, the same neighborhood, see each other at all these really intense transitional events like funerals, like weddings, mm -hmm. like graduations, without having some mess and some pain in there. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I agree. I don't think there should be a veil drawn mm -hmm. over, mm -hmm. you know, or, or right. <laughs> watercolors about what family is. Right. Like, let's look at it, improve upon it, and do better mm -hmm. with the family we choose. Absolutely. So uh, there's uh, something that you said uh, that uh, recently that really struck me. I thought, wow, that's, that's powerful. I want to follow up with her on that. You said, uh, family of choice for you is a verb, not a noun. And you were talking about that in the context of a group of friends that you're very close with and that you travel with on occasion and that, you know, so what do you mean when you say, for you, family of choice is a verb, not a noun? What I mean is that it takes care and attention. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just happen. And you get what you give. And so uh, part for me, because I think long game and because I think about aging all the time and I'm helping people through that process, I'll give you an example of what that looks like for me and my family of choice. Um, I, believe, I believe that care planning and planning for our futures is just as important as estate planning or retirement planning. Mm -hmm. Great, protect yourself legally, protect yourself financially, but mm -hmm. who's gonna take care of your body and your mind mm -hmm. when you are most vulnerable? So. With my, I said, well, if I'm telling other folks to care about this, I need to figure out how to do it in a way that's right for my family, mm -hmm. for my chosen family. And so um, I talk about this constantly with them. And I have a friend, actually, fam, my chosen fam, <laughs> um, who he and I have ha gone through a journey about his health care. Mm -hmm. Like he did not want to tell me anything for the first number of years of our friendship, even when he was having health issues. Mm. And finally, he was in the hospital uh, about a year and a half ago, and I, I had a conversation with him, and I said, this cannot continue. Mm -hmm. Like, we have to be really honest with each other. We're in this for life. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that this isn't the worst it gets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's gonna get a lot worse. Wow. You know, and I wanna be there with you in those rooms, in those moments so that you're not feeling alone, so that you're feeling confident and comfortable that you have support. Not that we're figuring this out in a hospital room. That's right. And so we made a promise to each other that we would be honest and straightforward about what was happening with our health. Mm. And since that no point, it was, a turning, mm -hmm. it was a turning point. Wow. And he claimed that and I claimed that. And so even, so there's been another hospitalization since and I got a call and was there and he let me buy him some groceries and like, mm. you know, check in and go to the aftercare appointments and things like that. And when I thought I was having a health scare, I emailed him and my other close friend and I said, I may go to the hospital today. If I do, this is what I'd like for you to do. Mm -hmm. This is what I'd like for you to do. Mm -hmm. And then my sister's my power of attorney. So we, we got the plan. So I'm communicating important. ahead of time yep. so that you're not caught off guard. You yep. can decrease some of that anxiety and mm -hmm. stress. Because mm -hmm. right when something happens, your family, including your chosen family, wants to help. Yep. But they don't know how. They don't know how. And nine times out of ten, with our friends, we put them in a different category than mm -hmm. our family of origin. Mm -hmm. So whereas if I tell my sister, no, leave me alone, don't show up, I'll be fine, I'll take care of myself, she's going to come through that door if she's worried about me. That's right. But with friends or family of choice, we kind of let there be some distance around that. Mm -hmm. We call that privacy. Right? If if a friend is sick, you're not necessarily going to barge through their door. Right. You're going to push and push and push, mm -hmm. but you're going to respect their privacy. Right. So why not, especially as queer people, mm -hmm. knowing that we are more likely than, than other folks mm -hmm. to need each other. Absolutely. Let's get comfortable with that. Yeah. Let's do this differently. Mm -hmm. Like, we're going to get older. We're going to be sick. We're going to need help. Mm -hmm. Let's claim that with each other mm -hmm. and and work through our own internalized crap about 
being less than or not being able-bodied or and not being our best selves, mm -hmm. right? That's all, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go real, <laughs> I feel like I'm like getting on a podium here, but oh, good. you know, I think that there's some, some really tough side effects of capitalism mm -hmm. and that like our worth is tied to what we can do. Right. And right. that's not our worth. No. And so it takes time to break through those ideas and it takes time to mm -hmm. break through that in ourselves. But we are our most valuable asset, so yeah. we deserve to do that and get comfortable mm -hmm. being with each other in the hard places. Mm -hmm. In the hard places, and when it, when it doesn't take a crisis to do that, when people are flustered and don't know how to support and show up, and it's taking a psychological toll and there's confusion. So a kind of planning and relationship building and, and kind of conversation mm -hmm. that people can have. and. People may not feel we may not feel comfortable with having all of that right away, but if we can even just start before an emergency happens, that makes a huge deal. Right, and we've done some of that too. We have, which I which I really appreciate. Yes, and, and was so grateful for because. Yes, I actually would love to share that. We're going to turn it over to questions soon for the the audience and, and folks who are tuning in. But I do have to say this that. So first of all, like I'm a part of the sister circle of friends. It's a small group of us. Um, these phenomenal human beings mean the world to me. And uh, they are friends, um, but this, this sister circle for me um, exemplifies where um, friends and family overlap. I really do consider them my family. They are my friends and they are my family. And I had thyroid surgery in October. Uh, there, I had a little bit of a scare. Um, I thought that perhaps I had thyroid cancer um, and they, I had a couple biopsies and all of that. Anyway, long story short, it wound up not being malign malignant. My lesions and tumors were um, benign, but um, I had these growths that were not gonna get any better and I had to have my entire thyroid removed. Um, and um, I actually was not afraid, but um, yet my sister circle just stepped up. They said, what can we do? We're gonna be there for you. Uh, when is your surgery? Do you want us there? Do you need us there? Uh, how can we support Tracy, you know, my wife? You know, and so I really appreciate it, not only the attention on me, but also understanding that my wife, who is a surgeon, but who actually wound up admitting to me, and Tracy is tough as nails, so for her to say that, she said, you know, I, I know, I feel that you'll be okay, but I'm nervous. She said, operating on someone is one thing, but when it's your own, life, having a surgery, it's something else. And the sister circle just turned out in full force. So I just want to say that, you know, but between the, the heart to heart conversations that we have together, our text messages, showing up for each other, having meals together, um, celebrating with each other, passing tissues, um, I'm very grateful for our sister circle of friends um, who are my family. And um, it's just a, um, a beautiful thing. So I definitely want to take, we're, um, we're at time now to take questions um, from the audience um, and the live stream. So let's do that. But first, let's thank Jackie. Oh, and Kelly. <laughs> All right, this question. You mentioned your CNA training uh, and our owner of the care plan. What, in your opinion, is the future of CNA as a profession, especially for African Americans? Well, I've, there's going to be opportunity. You know, there's going to be a lot of opportunity. Uh, with the baby boomers aging, there's not enough caregivers to meet that need, and folks are already feeling the crunch. So if you're interested in taking that step, absolutely do. Like, there's no reason not to. It's a, it's a relatively short program. You can do it in a few weeks. You can do it in a few months. Um, and, and you have those skills forever. And I am so, so grateful actually that I worked in a nursing home because it trains you, right? If I had done one-on-one -on -one care, if I had done it and never looked at it again, I wouldn't know physically the muscle memory of how to do that work. Mm -hmm. So at now, anytime, if I see a caregiver working, if I'm, if I'm just working with somebody that needs to help into the car even, it's automatic. So you'll have those skills for life and and more than that, it's a really great stepping stone. Like healthcare is a wonderful field to be in because there's tons of room for growth. So start with CNA. See if you feel comfortable working in a hospital, in a nursing home, in home care, and figure out if you want to do LPN, RN, 
you know, be a physician's assistant, go on to be a doctor, like it's limitless. If you're interested at all in taking care of people, I think getting your CNA is a great place to start and there will definitely be jobs available. And you get paid more as a caregiver, uh, as a CNA typically than as a caregiver because you have that additional training. That's helpful to know. Yeah, so in particular for black women, I would say go for it, but, but continue on. Oh great, that's helpful. Right, I want to see you as the administrator of the place. Mm. Y'all got your charge from this day. Okay. So we have a question from the live audience, Yvonne. Yeah, I um I wanted to do a follow up on that because um, I was wondering if um if that if the CNA itself is going to be professionalized. My interest is there are so many young African Americans who are going to be CNAs, mm -hmm. and some of them. population of which I am one but we all are part of it, everybody <laughs> is to some degree. but but the concern is is if it gets professionalized are African Americans going to be mm -hmm. how they've been in other areas where we'll be left out because you know so many people are doing this work because like I said this court order they get in some of these over the grocery store schools and they can get a mm -hmm. so that's what my concern is it's a viable career mm -hmm. But for many of these folks, it's just a job mm -hmm. until it gets professionalized, and then we'll be out looking to start up something else again, and won't be a part of this whole healthcare thing that's going to get bigger, especially with the artificial intelligence and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what my question is. So. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's that in and of itself is a is a part of the call to start something new or to really follow your heart, right? Because if you're called to do that work, by all means do it. There is going to be the work, even with the professionalization of it, which I, I don't see coming for a while. No, unfortunately, um, because there are so many, you know, it's the same issues we have in every other system, right? It's heavily dominated by women, it's mm -hmm. heavily dominated by immigrants, it's heavily dominated by people of color. So in terms of like what people get paid and the opportunities, I, I don't see that changing a ton. Which is why I'm suggesting, like, figure out what your dream really is. If it's being a CNA, great. But there's so much more out here. You know, I, I say all the time, like, I wish that I had started my business five years earlier. You know, I, I waited. I thought that I didn't have the knowledge. I thought that I needed a degree. I thought, you know, that I wasn't good enough yet. You're good enough. Mm -hmm. Go for it. There's going to be a ton of room in healthcare to be innovative and to figure out what your path is. And it doesn't need to look like anybody else's. And especially as women of color, we need to continue to be in charge and be at the tables that are making a difference for people. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that question. Question. Thank you. Next question. You talked about having time off, mental health and having autonomy in relation to working for someone else or organizations. How do you or That's Oh, a great question. That is a great question. Um, so for us, I don't allow anybody to work a traditional full-time job. Um, full-time for us is 30 to 35 hours a week, and everybody is it is an independent contractor. It's like so, in Europe. <laughs> right? Well, and if you need yeah. to take time, it's yeah. not a question. Just let me know when you're leaving and I'll back you up with the clients. So mm -hmm. it's it's just very free and people get paid for every single minute they work. Um, and, and that's, you know, it allows people to pursue their interests to do this from a place of health rather than a place of expectation, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to be anywhere nine to five. You can make your schedule as long as the work gets done and the clients are supported. Fantastic. Um, I, I pay people well and I mm -hmm. offer bonuses and make sure that, you know, last year for our, our retreat, we, I actually got us a home and took oh, us all wow. to Michigan for a weekend. And like, there's, and, and I'm only three years in business, right? Like, yes. there are ways to create work environments that are healing, not harming. And so I'm interested in doing that from jump with my organization. And so I hope that answers that question. No, it does answer the question. I have to say that that is incredibly inspiring. So as an FYI, the Care Plan is a very young organization. It celebrated its third anniversary last November. So it's not like this is an old company that's been around forever and that's had time to actually try certain things or whatever. So the fact that you have such a progressive business model 
um, is quite extraordinary, I find. Um, and, um, and the fact that in terms of the working conditions and in terms of your mission and how you do your work, not just your mission, but how you realize your mission is very, very inspiring. Oh, thank um, you. Uh, that, I mean, that is fantastic. But I think that's what, you know, when you get out of a system that is draining you, mm -hmm. you have so much more energy. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't, I didn't even figure out some of the ways that I actually felt about mm -hmm. what I wanted to create when I brought other people in till after a year. Like I needed a year to heal from having worked from the time I was 16 and and figure out like how do I actually work best, mm -hmm. right? And what can what can this look like? Right. So, yeah. That's incredible. Well again, um, this will conclude our second episode of Living Room Chats at Affinity Podcast. I want to give another warm welcome and thank you to Jackie Boyd. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you here in the live audience. I'd like to thank Affinity Community Services. Again, I, um, Affinity is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I've been a part of this organization since the early 2000s uh, when I was looking for a community, um, looking for a family of choice. Um, and Affinity has been that. And for the past three years, I wanted to do this podcast and to have uh, Affinity, in particular Imani and Anna, Yes. Um, and the board of directors who are so supportive means the world to me. So I want to thank Executive Director Imani Rupert Gordon and Anna Deshawn um, and the board for uh, their support and collaboration on this podcast, as well as Aisha Davis, who's also a dear friend and what vice president of the board, correct? Thank you. Um, and again, Affinity Community Services is located in the best city in the world, Chi-Town, Chicago, <laughs> on the south side yes. of Chicago, in the neighborhood of Bronzeville. Um, we do great work. It's a social justice and community building organization that works primarily with and on behalf of black LGBTQ communities, youth, and allies. And we do civic engagement, social justice work, advocacy, community building work. Um, and if you're looking for us, you can find us on Facebook uh, on, at Affinity Community Services. We're also on Twitter at Affinity CS. And our website is www.affinity95.org. That's www.affinity95.org. I am absolutely thrilled to have Jackie, I was thrilled to have Jackie as a, a dear friend and my guest tonight. And again, if you want to check her out, um, and her organization, it's The Care Plan. And you can find her at www.the-care-plan.com. So again, thank you for joining us. Our next podcast date is Wednesday, April 17th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, the podcast uh, will have a live audience like we have here tonight, and it will also be live streamed on Affinity's Facebook page. I know you wanna know who the guest is, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us in the living room at Affinity. I'm Kelly Salisbury. Good night. <laughs>